Right. Um, hello, everyone. Today is June the 13th, and that's official community meeting for Project Valero. That's our US European friendly time zone meeting. I, I can see some folks are adding themselves already to the meeting notes. I'm going to share the same meeting notes into our chat. So please add your topics there. And OK, I can see some stuff. All right. So I'm sure I see you've added some. Some do you want to go first? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, can I maybe share my screen? I need to walk through a yeah, few sure, things. Sure, sure, sure. Let me stop sharing. Here we go. Uh, just let me know if you can see it. Uh, Um, okay, so the first discussion topic is uh, just to get a re uh, review for this PR, so, uh, the support for multiple volume snapshot classes in the CSI plugin. I brought this up in the last meeting, then it was a draft, but now it's uh, in a good shape to review. Uh, I think few folks started reviewing it, but um, this will request for folks to review this further so that we can check this in. Um, second is uh, I was driving a PR, which was around um, the JSON substitutions during in the restore workflow. And we started uh, basically doing the implementation for it, but we kind of reached some realizations in the actual implementation part as to what library to use, what will be the best way. Uh, we kind of evaluated various approaches. So, um, I mean, there are certain technical challenges in terms of library support, uh, right? And so I, I wanted to discuss in this forum uh, with maintainers and the community as to what they think of, I mean, I, I basically walked through what we went through and what we are planning to do. Uh, I know maybe the PR itself, the proposal PR or the issue would have been a better place to do that. But I think um, it, since this is part of 1.12, it, it will help accelerate the discussion if you discuss this uh, in part of the meeting. In case you have any other specific design specific meetings, I think we, I can also maybe discuss there, but uh, I, I hope this is the right forum to maybe dive a little bit deeper in what we are facing right now. Um, let me know if any concerns, otherwise I'll basically start. Uh, so the initial JSON substitutions proposal that we had, right? We were planning to leverage the JSON path uh, library, which is part of the core Kubernetes code. And, uh, it is used by kubectl and it's supported uh, certain operators such uh, you can do operations such as parameters dot something, you can do dot dot for a recursive thing, you recurse across uh, through the whole JSON and you can find parameters using it. And um, yeah, there are a bunch of like do you, uh, operators that it supports. Like I said, dot, 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 uh, star for wildcard in an array, uh, indexing the array, those kind of operators it supported. Uh, our initial hunch was that we should be able to implement a good enough edit functionality on top of this library, just a wrapper on top of it. But we, when we actually went ahead to do it, it, it did not seem like trivial or the amount of code that we had to change in the uh, library was uh, did not seem like it will be maintainable over long time because the code that is written, it's kind of complex to maintain over time and change or fix bugs. So uh, yeah, this is the first approach we took, but what we are realizing is it, it might not be the right approach because it will kind of lead to uh, tech debt for the community and the repo over a long time. So currently what we are planning to pivot is, so this path, which I explained, right? This is like a a.b.c kind of thing, but there is also an, uh, um, method of uh, for referencing json using uh, you say slashes for example you say slash spec slash container slash zero slash image now this is part of the json patch rfc like json patch is a well-known thing uh, in the industry and there is an rfc i don't recall the exact way and kubectl for patching various resources they provide this capability where you can say do an operation replace on this particular path in the JSON uh, and you give a new value that you want to replace there. So that is uh, like another capability, uh, the, the other route we started exploring. Uh, kubectl itself uses a library uh, for JSON path, which is as following. So the current plan uh, is like we, at least the JSON path is not seeming to be fruitful. Uh, JSON patch at least gives us these capabilities out of the box and which is, is suiting us for us. But a couple of things to call out, right? Like by changing this approach, we are losing on a couple of things and we are gaining on a couple of things. So what we lose out on is uh, support for wildcard in paths. 
we lose out uh, yeah that is first part we kind of uh, lose out on and the, the the json path rsc do, does not have it by default like that is something if we want we can we will have to implement it uh, as part of the library what we gain is uh, that earlier in the json path we right we could not support operations such as uh, like this operations right you have remove you have copy you have add and i think a couple more but operations such as add were not very trivial to let's say implement in json path uh, code implementation um so we kind of this the, we are getting some benefits out of it we are still following what customers are already kind of aware of using the patch route is very common in the industry and in kubernetes world uh, but we lose out on wildcards and in addition there was another uh, thing that we had proposed was around providing a current value regex uh, so the plan was that when we go to this path we say if the value at this path is x only then change it to y uh, now the issue is that even in this library to achieve that kind of regex thing we will kind of end up needing to do a little bit of changes in the library itself um so that is like a gap uh, like like a gap which is there in both uh, where we have a regex support in some sense which we'll have to add so what i'm looking from for the community from the community is firstly uh, are you folks okay with json patch to json patch uh we personally felt it is solving pretty much the same purpose and it's not like a very uh negative thing second is the prioritization like the need for wild cards in paths we feel that in uh, for most customers they can still kind of stitch up this path and wild card is a delight but probably not something which is a blocker um right third is uh, regex uh, regex for current value this is this is something which we we think we should probably support but to support we will kind of have to fork the json patch library to some extent um so yeah, i mean i yeah uh, any thoughts initial thoughts questions or maybe maybe some folks do not have the context i can maybe walk through a little bit back but if there are maintainers on the call who are perhaps familiar with this thing maybe uh, your suggestions would be very helpful here I, I just checked the PR because I didn't have the context, and so while, while you were explaining these things, I quickly went through it. it. Yeah, it looks quite powerful, actually. I think it'll subsume a lot of transformations that are there independently, right? Like storage, class mapping, and things like that. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that it's going to replace all of those. Some of those, we, 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 I guess, we should take those case by case because because um, some of those that already have a well-known kind of history of being used, like storage class mapping. Um, may not be the best fit for this because that you know is easily configurable. But but we we can look at those case by case. Um, I, I'd say first and foremost, this solves the need for those that don't currently have internal actions, um, where a lot of times you know and you know you see an issue uh, on GitHub that says, "Hey, I need to do this," and the usual response yeah. from maintainers is, "Well, you need to write a plugin to do that." Um, well, this plugin will probably handle majority of those um kind of case specific I, mean, I think where this really shines is in something that's a specific transformation is needed for a specific user workload that's not generically applicable to all of right. all users um the more generic things like storage class mapping and some of those other ones might make sense to leave as is because it's a generic need that's easy to document how to do it and this this approach is a lot more flexible than that but it's also a lot because more of an advanced use case. I think users need to know what they're doing to, to right. do this. And so for some of these general uses where, you know, lots of users may need to do something very similar. I think those special case uh, actions still make sense, but this is great for the one-off cases and for advanced users that want to do something that's not out of the box, um, but they don't, they will no longer need to have to write their own plugin to do it. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it, it's definitely, and I have seen somebody raising up the issue of mapping the images as well in restore yeah. I, I don't know if that is merged yet but this will definitely take care of that i think correct okay. so yeah. that, that and, was and, and on, in terms of the wild cards that there's another case where if a user truly needs something where this doesn't work and they need a wild card that may be one of those edge cases where the answer still is you need to write a plugin you know for your specific use case mm -hmm. see just to point out right right if you really say we need wildcard support it's just a matter of like 
modifying the json patch library to some extent it might not be trivial but i think it is achievable it's more of either we take it as a scoping call we go out without wild cards and uh, after that we kind of ship it the only part is that we we will pretty much end up forking this library in the velero code base if we want anything additional by additional i mean regex and wild cards uh, right so that is a evaluation i want from the community right like would you folks be comfortable if it's it's not a very big library it's like this if four five six files but it will be a significant code base right so would you be comfortable with rather than just taking this as a dependency we take a fork and are have the freedom to add more features to it for like a call out here any I, thoughts around that just a, a general question because i've used that library myself in the past as well but without modifying it i've never actually looked at the release community around that library i don't know if that's something that we could instead of forking it convince the maintainer to add these features oh, if right. we if we implement them um it's something to consider at least i mean obviously mm -hmm. Working right. sometimes you have to do, but if you can get the project you're using mm -hmm. to take your patches, then you won't need to fork it. No, it's a good idea, but actually the issue is that that library claims that they are based on the RFC uh, of JSON patch RFC. So I I really doubt that they will be in interest to deviate from that. Um, that is a. Oh, I see what issue. you're saying. Because 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 then we we would be we would be moving away from that implementation. Uh, correct, correct. They might not like. Prefer that makes that. sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so in in general, yeah. So uh, I I haven't reviewed the design yet, but uh, looks good to me. Like the use cases and stuff like that. Uh, one question though, like, what if the user tries to um, gives us a path and that's an immutable thing to do? How would you tackle that? Uh, so this is before the create restore call. So if like it's like a new resource creation, it it won't really land up in an immutable state. The immutable issue will come when you go for a patch. Uh, like you have skip and right. patch policies in Velero, right? So oh, right. in skip, it's uh, it's not really an issue, but in patch, I think that's like right. a user uh, enforced issue. Right, right, right. This is not a Kubernetes patch. This is this is patching the JSON. So so this is no yeah. different than. Um, you know, what we do in plugins already, except yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, like, we're just taking, you know, the input is, is, uh, the, right, un, it's you know. for, it's like the actual JSON in back of yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay. Right. So, so, so I think this is, I mean, I'm assuming, and again, I haven't looked at this in detail recently, but, but I'm, I'm guessing all this is going to happen within the execute, um, function in the plugin. Mm, so the yeah, input yeah. is still, um, uh, you know, uh, um, the, the, the resource, um, and then the then the output is the modified resource. Correct, um, correct, correct. Yeah. Just before the create call, we are planning to do this. So, uh, oh, that's right. And so this is, not, this is not in a plugin. This is actually in the uh, in the restore logic itself. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. That was approved. Right, like discussed right. in the community meetings. And that's, that's right. Sorry. Sorry. I remember that. that I forgot about yeah. that that change. Yeah. Um, but so yeah. so you, we have this unstructured object that we've um, that we're modifying here, and then we do the create call. So th the effect is identical to doing it in a plugin, but we're not actually doing it in a plugin. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was trying to like uh, come to. Like, if that is getting executed in this way, then we could always have a. That that was the whole purpose of uh, restore item action plugins, right? So, well, yeah, I mean, this is this is this is essentially doing this, uh, this doing some of the same things as restore item action plugin, plugin, but in a different uh, way. Plugin framework, right? This is an alternative uh, to the plugin. plugin Correct. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, this, so, 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 I would expect this might be able to replace some plugins, um, but mean, but certainly not all plugins. Yeah, I, I, I get that. But if if RIA is able to solve your use cases, then uh, uh, like I would ask, do we do we really need this? I think there is Shubham, There is consensus mostly around this. I mean, I, I would basically I'm trying to defer discussing if it's yeah. uh, if we want I mean, it or not i think it's already part of the milestone we debated on this yeah. earlier as well uh, customers have their own crds which you can't like i mean you can't expect every customer to go and write their own plugin if this is solving it in a generic way for everyone i think right. so is, so I, 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 it may be that I, I, should, I think another way of asking a similar question to what you're asking which again we discussed previously um but i had forgotten about that is that this entire thing could be implemented as a plugin rather than in the direct rather than in the um, restore logic, um, yeah. and yeah. then then you'd have a plugin that took like, in this JSON patch um, stuff. A, a general um, array native plugin as well, right? Right. Um, but in terms of the value to an end user, 
Um, and, the, the, and that's kind of unrelated to whether we implement this as a plugin or in the restore logic directly. Um, the value to the end user is um, if you have a one-off change, oh, I need to strip this field or modify this field in this one object, uh, but I'm an end user. I'm not you know, developing a product based on Valero. Um, those users in general don't want to have to write their own plugin, compile their plugin images and all that if they can just provide a, a configuration um, that of, you know what the JSON patches are. Um, yeah, yeah, that's th th this helps there. Now, again, that's completely separate from the question of is this functionality best implemented in the restore logic directly or as a plugin? And it might be worth um, refreshing my memory as to yeah, I'll quickly refresh, well, you know, right? the, the, the thinking the... behind the decision there. Because I remember we had that decision. We talked about it. Uh, I just don't remember all the details. Yeah, it, it was around the, the number of gRPC calls we might end up making to the plugin. That was the concern because there could be potentially hundreds of resources and uh, you don't want to make a gRPC call for the plugin. And that is why Daniel proposed that instead of going the plugin route, let's make it core functionality. But but another question, are we, and again, this this is this is kind of basic for Valero stuff. So Shiba, maybe you know the answer here. Um, for the internal restore item actions, the ones that aren't um, built as separate images, mm -hmm. do we make gRPC calls for those or do those end up being just internal regular calls? Yeah. I think uh, I'm not sure about that, but I think those are just internal calls. I'm just thinking because we have, we have a number. If you look in the the Valero yeah, yeah, yeah. code base itself, yeah. we have a number of backup item actions and restore item actions that are implemented yeah, right. using the interface. Yep. Yeah, yeah. um, but they're not in a separate image like the the storage plugins. Um, they're in the Valero image itself. Um, I didn't think those made gRPC calls, um, but I could be wrong. Um, I guess the point is, if the only reason to avoid it is a gRPC call, is it possible to write this as an internal restore item action that doesn't make gRPC calls? Um, I guess we need to confirm that first, you know, whether our understanding is correct. Because I'm just thinking if it uses the restore item action workflow because it implements the interface, but it's still an internal call, um, when Valero server registers all those internal restore item actions um, at service startup, uh, I guess the question is, do the, if those don't go through gRPC, then we could write this as a restore item action that takes the yep. same inputs just like it is now so that the restore code flow and the workflow is unchanged, but we still avoid the gRPC calls. Um, I know making it an external plugin that's a separate image would um, involve that gRPC yes, overhead. Definitely. And uh, regarding the RIAs for CRDs, uh, that's the whole point of the plugin framework, and yeah. Oh, I mean, definitely use uh, RIs and BIs for CRD changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think I think we we do want to have people write plugins if they have functionality yeah. that requires that was it. The whole point of the framework. Yeah. but 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 at the same time, if it's a very simple case, like oh, I need to for my pods remove this one field from spec for every pod that I restore. Yeah, yeah, um, you know, if I could just put in some bit of, um, you know, configuration here that some internal restore item action takes care of for me, then I don't have to write, you know, Golang code as an end user of Valero. Yeah, um, yeah. I think, I think, I think, I think part of the issue here is that um, the overhead to write a plugin just to make a simple change across all your resources um, for an end user who's not developing a product based on Valero. Um, is a bit high. Um, now for complicated use cases, that, that still makes sense. It's a very powerful thing to be able to write a plugin to do whatever you want there. But at the same time, if we're handling some of these more generic cases, um, or is that generic, but simple, simple cases. Um, for So when a user has something that only matters to their cluster, but it's a simple mm -hmm. transformation, this implementation will let them do that without having to write their own plugin. Um, Ideally, yeah. it would be implemented as a restore item action, I, I, I would think. Uh, and I know we may be going back with something we decided a while back. And, and um, But if we can avoid the gRPC call, at least, I think it makes sense. Um, if performance concerns require us to do it differently, that's that's one thing. Um, but if, if an internal restore item action also avoids the gRPC call, then this these transformations happen through the same course of the regular um, plugin operations, uh, even if, if I'm not making gRPC calls. 
yeah de definitely I, I agree with the ease and uh, the performance if issue if that exists then yeah uh, this feature totally makes sense i just wanted to uh, double check with you guys yeah fair enough i think that we can quickly circle on we were i mean the top level implementation wherever we put it i think it's we can just port it into an ria or in the course yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah i mean i think the bulk of the of the work here is going to be the same either way it's a question of how we yeah. can get it in and yeah. I, I just yeah. think that I, mean, I would like to revisit the question if doing it as sure, a, sure. an internal ria doesn't involve the grpc then let's do it that way um i would that would be my 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 uh, and, and, and maybe, I may be missing something. Maybe Daniel has some other reasons um, for suggesting this. Um, I just don't remember. Um, I, I remember the conversation. I just don't remember all the details. Uh, no fair point, Scott. I think we we can quickly revisit this part of it. I think uh, and wherever it makes sense, we can put it. Uh, not no worries about uh, that part. The current uh, the why I brought it up today was around this library support and are you okay with putting a little bit more code so that we are able to have that extensibility. Are you comfortable with that? And Velero is what I kind of wanted to touch base on. Um, any thoughts on that point? I, uh, I would, um, I, I guess one thing I would say is that if we're talking about doing things that are outside of the JSON patch RFC, right. I wonder if instead of just forking and hacking that, would it make sense to create our own API that's built on top of JSON patch? So in other words, we do JSON patch plus some things um, yeah, so, that's the plan. That's so the that plan. we import we, we that library, but we don't necessarily fork it because we're doing that and some other. I, I don't know if that makes sense or would work with what we're trying to do here. It, it, it doesn't bother me so much to fork a library to enhance it if we need to, um, in one sense. But if we're forking the library to make it no longer implement what the library claims to implement, that, that seems like the wrong way of doing that. So, so it would implement whatever it implements so far, but whatever additional functionality we need, that is just a cherry on top, right? That's, for example, I just want to see what is the value at this place. I just want to function for that. The current library won't have a public function to do that specific thing. I just want to see what is the value here, do a regex match and then call JSON patch. Now that function, just that function will be private today and not public. Yeah. That Those kind of things, if we take like a fork in our, in the letter repo, we can kind of achieve it. Um, yeah. It's like small, small changes. It's Those are things that you can't achieve by just putting a wrapper on top of it. You right. kind of... And those Eventually. are, and, and, and I think at the same time, it, it might be worth at least, you know, putting an issue in upstream to see, are these things, are these the kinds of changes that would be accepted as patches or not, uh, if they enhance functionality in ways that okay. doesn't, um, you know, contradict the RFC they're trying to implement. Um, got it. Uh, that is part one, and like this is one requirement, and second is the wildcard thing, which is, uh, which is definitely not a part of the RFC. Right, right, um, right. That is, that is it. Yeah, different issue. So, okay. Um, uh, I mean, I this thing quick, will... quick points. Yeah. On should I yeah, go ahead? Sorry, I'll let you finish. Yeah. Uh, no, nothing, nothing. This, I was just summarizing this part. I'll revisit. And for this, I think I still need more inputs uh, on, uh, like, if if it's, I'll maybe start with the fork, uh, or maybe start with the library, and we can take it from there. Um, yeah, just just wanted to feel the pulse of the community and let you folks know what I'm planning to do. So that it doesn't come really as a surprise. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay. Um, so as part of this, I, I'm guessing the Velero command will be enhanced to pass in this information. Or there's not the in the plan. Uh, uh, are you saying uh, the Velero? Yeah, yeah. So we already uh, decided that this will, so similar to how resource policies came uh, as a config map reference in the Velero CR, we kind of got approval for passing this. Uh, as a config map reference in the backup CR. I have a reference here. Okay, so Velero restore create command. So Velero restore create command won't have any option. Okay. It will, it will, it will. It will from there. Okay. So this is in the restore CR, then not the backup CR, right? Restore CR, yeah, yeah, sorry, restore CR. This is similar to how policies was done. Oh, yeah. Okay. This is the, but but if, I, if, if I, somebody is creating a restore using Velero command, right? Velero restore create, do they have an they, option of passing this config now? Okay. Yes, yes, they will. They will. They will. Okay. And, and is this targeted at 1.12? Yep, yeah, correct. It, it is the issue is tagged for 1.12. 1.12. Okay. And one final thing. So, in the previous discussion, right, uh, I think we were all talking about this only being done before create, uh, before the actual resource is created. but if the resource uh, replacement policy is update, right? 
uh, doesn't Veluro actually patch the existing resource? So I'm guessing this uh, applies there as well. That, that's true, um, but that's to me that's kind of separate, uh, kind of out of scope of this. I mean, this is just another way to modify resource on restore. Um, any other plugin can do the same thing. So the the concern about mm -hmm. Valero, um, you know, patching on restore. Um, anytime you restore something that's already there and we patch it. Um, if you try to modify an immutable object or an immutable field, fail. Um, that's right. not the fault of the plugin. That's that you know. That's just the way Kubernetes works, and we'll get a, an appropriate sure. um, you know warning no, if that happens. But but you're but but that's a that's not this patch. That'll still just be the same patch we normally do in the regular restore workflow. So so this code doesn't kick in in those cases, or this will still apply. Well, the, the, this code kicks in in the same place that a plugin does so so the, the, right. the, these are changes we make you know based on the restore when, when we restore the first thing we do is we load the json from the from the backup tarball we then call the restore item actions um which makes modifications to that content um and you know so essentially if you have a restore item action even outside of this that you know say it removes um you know a, a node selector um right. from a pvc um the end result is we re we create that resource as if the backup tarball has that modified resource in it. So we read from a file, we make modifications to the JSON in memory, then we create. Um, this would just be one more thing in that chain of modifications. It's still happening. Right. You know, after you read the file, you make a series of modifications to that JSON in memory. Um, this is you know one in that chain. Um, and then we do a create. Um, if the thing already exists and the resource existing resource policy is set to to patch um, or update, yeah, update, sorry, um, then we patch it. Um, if that patch fails because it tries to modify something that's immutable, um, then we, um, you know, then we get a failure or warning. I forget which one it is right now. Um, right. In fact, we're at, and then I think we're, I guess we're in the process of adding another another option to that resource policy to recreate so that if the patch fails, um, this new resource policy, which again, Shubham, we're targeting this for 112, right? Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's in 112 and there is a draft PR up for recreate option. Okay, so if recreate is set, then if the patch fails because it tries to modify an immutable field, then we delete the resource in the cluster and recreate it based on huh. the restore. Okay. But again, all of that is kind of separate. This is just, the way I look at this is, and, and this is true whether or not we actually implement it as a restore item action or in the, work, in the restore workflow, this functions as yet another thing that modifies the content before we, before we restore it, um, just right. like the rest of the plugins. Right, understood. Yeah, and, and in fact, this nicely segues into what I wanted to talk about, a discussion topic I did put over, right? I mean, replace option, but we can talk about it at that time. Yeah, yeah okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Any questions for me? You were, uh, you were, I mean, uh, as content ended up answering any other questions you had, uh, you were asking. Oh, no, no, I'm good. Yeah, th th this oh. looks pretty good and pretty powerful. And especially for people who are building uh, products on top of Velero, right? The yeah. end user, it may be a little bit tricky for them to really provide all this information. But if the other products, like for example, Cloud Casa, make it easy for people to provide that information and behind the scenes create this config map, I think this will be really powerful. Yeah, Th thanks for doing it. Definitely great. Thanks, uh -huh. Anshun, for putting this together. Yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, just to close right this, I think maybe Shubham uh, or Scott, if you folks can maybe help. I, I have gone through the plugin invocation code, but I am also not very sure if it's gRPC or internal for internal plugins. Yeah. If you folks could maybe help with that, that would be great. Sure, yeah, and yeah, we'll second, look into yeah. this, fine. Yep. Yeah, this for this one, I don't see a hard no no against like maybe for uh, doing a soft fork. I'll perhaps start with it and see what are the bare, min very minimal changes, or if I can maybe mix and match multiple packages to let's say just one package for just fetching details and one for editing. I'll play around with that, but for now, I don't see a strong up opposition to like it's a small package. We can perhaps fork it as well. Yeah, so I, that's I, what I, I think. Yeah, I, I still think that it, before. At the point where we think we need to fork it, we should probably also consider uh, submitting those changes upstream yeah, to see if the maintainer will accept yeah, them as yeah, is. Yeah. Because th then the fork might be a temporary fork. We'll fork it now, but by the time we release, mm -hmm. maybe they have a new one out that then we can get rid of that. Just just so that from a long term point of view, we don't have to okay. maintain that code. Uh, no, that makes sense. For, uh, I, I, I'll do that. Okay. Uh, that's it. That's it from my end, uh, folks. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, stop sharing.
Thank you. Um, okay, next one, Shubham. Do you want to share or should I share? Uh, I'm good. Uh, I just have a uh, status, status update that I've been reviewing data more PRs for 112 and I had put up some bug fixes and uh, also would ask the community folks to review the updated deprecation policy PR that we have in place uh, so that we can go ahead with the proposal workflow. I'll link the PR. Uh, and and Shiva, in terms of deprecation policy, I guess the, 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 our primary concern with deprecation policy is once that gets approved, then we can go down, down the process of deprecating Rustic. Or, or were there other things as well that you were thinking of? Or is Rustic the main thing we're talking about deprecating at this point? Yeah, I think Rustic and Copia, right? Uh, how would that play in the future? Right, right, exactly. So once we have this approved, then we actually have the ability to declare Rustic. Um, deprecated, um, you know, whether that's in 1.12 or 1.13, but at, at some future point, we can then deprecate RESTIC and then we, by the policy, once we agree to this policy, we'll then know when this means we can remove that code from the code base. Yep. Thanks, Shubham. Mm -hmm. uh, that's it from home. Thank you. And I have a few stuff. Um, <clears throat> Daniel is on uh, COVID sick leave, so we can, for sure. Uh, we have end of the week to, to submit for our open source summit. Uh, we started a, a document with Scott and Daniel to figure out the whole CFP and abstraction and stuff. Um, anyone is going to apply for, because KubeCon China and KubeCon North America are ending up on 18th of June. So that's this Sunday, I think, um, for the CFP. So anyone going to submit for, for North America or as far as I get it, you're still not sure. If yeah, you're I'm, gonna I'm pretty if sure you... on the Red Hat side that um, I'm not available for that. Um, just talking to Wes about that earlier today, because um, we're, we're kind of trying to get approval for, for Shanghai. And part of that is, you know, deciding, hey, we're only asking for one, so that way we can maximize the chance of getting the one. If we ask for two, then, you know, it's a lot riskier. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, as my understanding, is where we are with that. So if if there's someone on the VMware side that is available for North America, whether it's yourself or Daniel or one of the other developers, then certainly submitting the same talk for that would make sense. It's just that I don't, personally, I don't believe I'm available to commit to that. Okay. Okay, I can submit for, for North America. I'll be there. Yeah, uh, and, and, and whatever slides that we come up with for Daniel and me for Shanghai or whatever, you know, if assuming that gets approved, um, you know, we can use the same ones there. Um, and and because they're both submitting at the same time, um, that whole thing of, oh, if this talk has been done before, how is it different doesn't apply here because we're submitting them at yes. the same time. Yeah. So yeah. that's Correct. the advantage there. And, and the whole uh, um, public, so the... The actual people that are going to attend the one thing are primarily China locals. Right, but, but, so... but I just mean in general, if this were, say, six months later, and we already did the talk in Shanghai, then we would have to explain in the proposal how this was different than the one we did in Shanghai because um, yep. you know, we're asking for it again. But since we're proposing these at the same time, there's no obligation should, to do that. Should be all right. Yep. It, yet. it can be the exact yeah. same talk. You get okay. a twofer. Yep. <laughs> all right. So, okay. So yeah, I let's just it. work it out with you and me and Daniel the rest of this week to get whatever content together for that, um, for the abstract, um, and then we can submit both. Um, and you know, we can yeah. submit both for Daniel and All myself right. for Shanghai and for you for um, um, Chicago. And yeah, you know, and, and, and as else. we know uh, with the last with the OSS, if if anything changes and different people become available, we can always add a speaker later. Correct. Um, you know, yeah. But, but, so let's just to... not count on any of those changes because they probably won't yep. happen. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, in that case, I think uh, the panel discussion for NA will drop for for, for, the, for this time. Then, as uh, you're not sure you're gonna join, and yeah, and th unless there's enough people from other play other companies that are available other than Red Hat, yeah, you know, for the panel discussion. So that I guess that's the question yeah, here: is it is it yeah. who else available besides you? you know? We'll be available from the cloudcast, so definitely we are going both to 
uh, will be there at Shanghai as well as in North America. Exact uh, people haven't decided yet uh, to Shanghai at the very least, uh, okay. but it's guaranteed that somebody, uh, some people will be there from Cloud Council. Uh, sorry, but I missed that. Uh, who is speaking? Uh, so oh, I sorry, uh, this, this is Ragu, uh, Raghuram. Okay. Uh, they were Satya yeah. Okay. Joining, I think, uh, yeah. Sure. 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 I'm. I'm. Yeah. I'm going to forward you something that we used in the past to apply for a panel discussion. Um, okay. So you, if you think that that kind of topic uh, interested you, uh, so we can join and do um, something. Or else, so are you are you um, submitting a panel discussion for Shanghai, or is that not happening? Or. Oh. Um, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, uh, we can submit for Shanghai as well. The same thing, uh, if you want. We can have like one submission, you and Daniel, and then a parallel one. Yeah, right, or... yeah, yeah. The, 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 as I understand the rules for submit multiple submissions is that um, each each person can be submitted as a speaker for one type. So in other words, you know, Daniel or myself could be in a panel discussion and a regular talk, but not yep. in two panel discussions and not in two talks. So. Yep. Yeah. So, 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 uh, and it's up to five in a panel discussion. So we can figure out, you know, which five people we want to submit are those that are planning to be there. Um, on, the, on the Red Hat side, Tiger or uh, Wes may be available as well. I don't know, unless there's another panel discussion that Wes is submitting for, I'm not sure. Um, I'm, I am not. Okay. Yeah. And also, I, I, I don't think the the regular diversity rules apply for, for China also. So, uh, it, uh, the rules are a bit loose there. Well, well, I do, I do know the rules about the number of submissions you can have um, do apply there because it was listed in, in the, the CFP. Um, in the number of, of submissions, know, number. I, I think you, you don't have limits on the number of submissions. I, th I thought uh, I saw that. I, I could be wrong, but I, I, th I thought I read that in, in the guidelines. Oh, let's see. follow the normal OSS. Um, uh, normally, you have rules on who should be on the... Um, on the panel discussion. But either way, we're only submitting one panel discussion. So again, since that doesn't count against the, on a regular talk, um, that should be fine. Yeah. I think it's three to five people. Um, so we can submit that to five people as, as speakers. Yeah, we have to, yeah, okay. So um, Raghu, and I'm gonna send a link to, to previous document that we used to combine the ideas for, for the panel discussion. Yeah, sounds uh, good, yeah. So let's try to figure out in the next few days uh, who wants to join on that panel discussion so we can fill out the form until whatever 18th is. I think it's Sunday. Yeah, yeah. And also yeah. for CFPs, right? I mean, we we are also considering something like the namespace level are back for Velero plus Cloud Casa because we have something like that, you know, that's possible today. Um, but, you know, we haven't submitted yet. And frankly, the, our record of, you know, is kind of poor. We submitted almost every KubeCon multiple proposals. So it's a bit, uh, you, you, you get disheartened after a few yeah. attempts and <laughs> yeah. not getting yeah. accepted, right? So there's always some resistance and some inertia in that, but I guess uh, yeah. this is a good topic. Uh, and we have seen people asking for it, that namespace level are back for yeah. Velero and we, you can do that with Cloudcast. So if anybody in this, uh, in this group, wants to collaborate with us at least in the in the present day in this talk let me know uh, but we will most probably submit that cfp for north america i think yeah and another thing to keep in mind is that since this is um um kubecon and uh, open source summit combined um there's also a cloud uh, topic track and open source summit um that might be um worth submitting that, that's actually what um um what we were planning on doing with daniel is because um we because we have, we have similar similar history with Valero uh, talks not being accepted to um, KubeCon, but we submitted to Open Source Summit North America last year and got it approved. Um, I don't know if it's just there are fewer cloud related things uh, submitted there or what, but um, since this is co-located both Open Source Summit and um, KubeCon, it might be worth considering submitting your talk to the kind of cloud topic under Open Source Summit um, for Shanghai. Yeah, that's good to know. Yeah, think about it. Yeah. Thank you. The thing is, the, the submissions are the number of submissions is so big that they have to. By they, I mean CNCF and the people who are actually filtering out talks, 
they have to priority like or oh, to put priority on talks which are directly related related either for projects which are under the CNCF code or um, like emerging projects and stuff. And Valero is super well established and still not yet under CNCF, so it's like not the appropriate candidate on first sight. So well, open source cool. summit. <laughs> right. Right. Open Source Summit is the right place, uh, in my opinion, for, for these kind of talks. Has Velero applied to be in CNCF? I'm not sure. Not yeah, yet. But, oh, not. Are, okay. Is there any discussions about that? Because we're interested in, in helping that, if, if we can. Everybody is interested in this one, including me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, for now, as from VMware's side, we are holding that uh, until the... Um, Broadcom acquisition ends. So yeah, something it's, it's still not clear. Is it uh, how to say? So we need uh, to go it, blow up some regulators or something. Is what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. That, that will help actually a lot of parties <laughs> and, and and my pocket uh, in particular. But that's not uh, what I mean. Uh, so um, so the panel discussion, I'm going to send you, Ragu, I'm going to send you that link. Actually, I'm going to send it into Valero Dev. Uh, so okay. someone else wants to join. And we can put that in for both, as, as Scott mentioned. Uh, actually, we're ditching a little bit the rules, <laughs> if that was presented or not. So we can, we can apply for both for this one. All right. So yep. that kind of answers my question, who's joining. Uh, Vimora is going to join Red Hat. For, for Shanghai primarily. Uh, anyone from Dell who's gonna join Shanghai or or Chicago? Do we have Dell people on the call? Or anyone from Microsoft? Yeah. Hey, uh, not for Shanghai, but North America is maybe like, you know, uh, in a month or so. Uh, can you repeat that last one, please? I, I was saying not for Shanghai definitely, but for North America, we are trying. Uh, maybe okay. I'll let you know in, uh, in a few weeks, if I have more clarity. Um, but I'm sure. Do, do do you think if we apply for the panel discussion, uh, that you um, make your chances to to get there, and you can uh, use that for? It I mean, might. It if, might. If, let me let yeah. me check. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's but, a good idea. Let me check with my mm -hmm. team. Uh, yeah, my, my idea is to. If we want to do a panel discussion, it doesn't make sense to be only VMware people or only Red Hat people or one company only. At right. least one per one per company <laughs> that mm -hmm. we represent the in the community. So it mm -hmm. can be an actual discussion, not a product oh, pitching. Right. That's the the <laughs> yeah. So I get it. I get it. Uh, then, uh, yeah. Yeah. Let right. me let me check with my team. Uh, if I have any update, I'll let you know. But for Shanghai, we're definitely not there. Uh, okay. North America, let me see. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Okay, so in that case, for Shanghai panel discussion, it will be something between VMware, Red Hat, and and Cloud Casa. In that case, uh, maybe Scott or Tiger or Daniel from from VMware, and someone from Ragu from Cloud Casa. Okay. Uh, we have issues with ordering some some swag for China uh, as the local local uh, people that are doing this track are a little bit complicated to communicate with, but keep you posted with this one. Um, same thing um, will be achieved for Chicago whenever uh, we have the uh, the budget open. So th that's that's from my side. Um, uh, anyone else planning to print and bring some, some, some swag for Chicago and, and Shanghai? And do you need anything from my side about this one? I mean, Valero related track, <laughs> plus plus some company logos all around the place. But uh, by the way, I still have that blue shirt uh, from the uh, from Cloud Casa from from Amsterdam. Oh, that's good. Good to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Aha. Yeah, I, I I I forget to wear it today. Anyway, uh, so Raghu, uh, you have some question. Uh, yeah, I mean, some of it actually we discussed, and uh, the reason I brought I'm bringing this up is because we've been uh, I see some confusion in at least internal testing people in Cloud Casa uh, about the exact meaning of this resource replacement during restore the update strategy, right? 
Um, so it, it's kind of very clear when we're talking about resources such as config maps and, and secrets, for example, right? You just want to uh, replace the data, but update the data. But when you're talking about things like PVCs and, and pods, it's not as clear. For example, I have a PVC currently attached to a pod that is running. What does it mean uh, repl uh, restoring the PVC with the replacement strategy as update? In my mind, it shouldn't apply uh, at least because you don't want, users may expect that files of the PVC may be replaced, which is not the yeah. correct yeah, I mean, what we're replacing, I mean, when we say resource replacement, we're talking about the step in the, in the, in the restore where we actually create the resource. So we're talking about Kubernetes uh, metadata pretty much exclusively here. Um, and Chubam, remind me, I know when we talked about adding the, the original proposal had not just a top level policy, but also a, um, a kind of resource type specific override. Um, and I, I know we didn't implement that in the first version for simplicity. Um, I know when we talked about adding the uh, replace, um, we, we wanted to bring that back because replace is something we may want to only want to do for certain resource types. Um, does the current um, plan for 112 include bringing that back from the original design as well so that you could say, I want to update, not replace, but then, you know, say I want secrets to be replaced, um, but I want PVCs to be left as is, uh, not unchanged. Uh, no, it, it's it's not part of uh, the draft PR that we have up. It's uh, the PR that Tiger put up. It is uh, an like extension of the existing functionality with a recreate yeah. option. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it kind of it, it kind of concerns me to to have the notion of a replace policy across the board because I think for some resource types that could be dangerous mm -hmm. um, because if you delete something you you're not guaranteed that you can recreate it. Um, yeah, be, like, I mean I don't know that the timing works for this, yeah. but and I'd be more comfortable having that policy available at the same time allowing you know resource type overrides. So you could say you know for this type just leave it alone and for this type, replace it and for this type. Um, th that would be yes. in addition to, not not instead of the- you Maybe know, we can use this uh, feature in conjunction with resource policy feature. So right, but handy. Except, right. except resource policy is really just for PVCs though, right? Yeah, yeah. So there was oh, a- well, 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 what, I, what I mean is that for the existing resource policy, um, right now what we have is the base level functionality, which is, apply this policy to everything. Everything, yeah. Uh, and the original design proposal had us kind of a, a phase yeah. two enhancement, which would say yeah. also allow override. So that, you know, yeah. say your default policy um, that you set in the existing resource policy is update, but maybe mm -hmm. you set pods or PVCs or certain resource types, um, you know, yeah. to, yeah. to um, you, know, you know, not none. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so that for certain types, we don't modify at all. And then say for config maps and secrets, um or whatever we, we set it to replace um yeah. so um that, that, that doesn't need to be part of this pr uh, i think that that, yeah. that that could be an enhancement follow-on yeah. pr that adds that functionality basically the the alternative that we had discussed in the design was existing resource policy config then under underneath that you'll have a patch underneath that included resources array list and stuff like that so that would yeah, be um, more granular. Yeah, and, 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 I mean, we, we had yeah, we had three proposals. There was there was the yeah. the simple one of just you know default across everything. We had yeah. that you know resource specific one, um, yeah. you know what's where we can include exclude, um, and then we had the 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 hybrid where we took the default one as what we took for anything that didn't match um, below, and then we allowed the overrides. Um, and so, um, what, from what I remember, we originally decided is, hey, we're just going to do the, the the easy, you know, the the, the yeah. top level default. That's that that gets eighty percent of what we need easily. Um, but with the idea that then we could add the kind of ability to um, override that for specific resources um, on top of that. So you could say the default is going to be replaced or update, and then modify it. Um, I, I, I just, it just seems to me that set doing a restore where you say replace. You know, delete and replace anything that that, that gets an error on on mm -hmm. updates um, might be risky for certain yeah, uh, data. Yeah, definitely, there is room for enhancement. I agree. So, Raghu, could you create a RFE issue for this? That would be uh, like, yeah, yeah. 
so that yeah. you could just and, 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 and in particular like Raghu said you know mm-hmm. Updating really doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, setting update in the context of PVC doesn't really make a lot of sense because even if you did update on the PVC, um, right. you wouldn't. You, you would just be updating metadata. You wouldn't be updating content. And as the Valero restore functionality that creates Kubernetes resources, that's not the part that, that creates the PVC data. Yeah. You know. Right. That that's one of my points. That maybe the existing docs. You know, we should explicitly clarify that. Yeah, oh, oh, th- uh, we definitely. I, th- I think that that's another point. I mean, maybe maybe create a separate second uh, GitHub issue to to clarify the docs. That this this the scope of this is specific yeah. to Kubernetes metadata in Kubernetes resources, um, not, not, not files or file systems or any of that. Yeah, yeah, I right, right. Yeah, I can, yeah. I can do that as well. Yeah, so because they, definitely this came with the confusion because somebody in our team expected, I mean, at least they thought that you know maybe the files are going to be replaced, but obviously that that's yeah. not going to happen. Like it's, it's yeah. not a uh, substitution to incremental data update. So yeah, right, right, right. yeah. Yeah, I mean the, the oh. only the only although here, well here's the thing, if you're well this is the problem because because the delete and recreate might replace the files in some circumstances depending on how you created that but but yeah. but again there's no guarantee there because you know what's data mover doing you know i think the only way to reliably update the file content is to actually delete that pvc before restore that way you're yeah. guaranteed for data mover or rustic or whatever to restore start with a new mean. pvc yeah. copying right. the data you know through its usual method yep yep that is true. I mean, I, I meant the documentation update for the existing update policy because definitely in that case, you're not going to touch the files right, in right. the PVC. Yeah, so I'll, I'll submit, yeah, an RFP for that. And third question, and probably the last question is uh, one about the implementation itself. So uh, the doc says you, know, you compare the existing, re- this is again for the existing implementation, not for the new one. So you compare the resource with what is already present and then you patch. So when you say compare, what, how exactly, what are the things being compared? I mean, I haven't looked at the code, I can, but- I, I believe we just do a get on the resource and then we do mm-hmm. a reflect, is, is, or, or, or do we do yeah. it like a, it's a, it's a DB equal or is that what we're doing comparing the, the YAML? We use the reflect package to check for if there is a difference. Yeah. Oh, so this goes yeah. through pretty much everything, status, annotation, yeah. variable, spec, everything. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so basically, basically, what we do is, the, you know, we, we we do a get on the resource in the cluster. If it's, if it's not there, then we're just then we know it doesn't exist, and we just create it normally. Right. If it exists, um, then we compare it. And if it's the same as what's already there, then we we leave it alone. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's different than what's already there, then the policy matters. If the policy is none, then we just log a warning saying, hey, it's different. But I'm not touching it. Um, if it's if it's update, then we do a patch. Uh, if the patch fails, then we warn, mm-hmm. hey, the patch failed. We, we try um, to update the labels. If the, we do have to have labels either way. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Right. Even right. if it hasn't changed, yeah. we still have to have labels. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and that's important say, because that way you know this resource, even though it was already in the cluster, is valid and current as of the most recent restore. Right. The restore name is in the label. So when you say patch, the end result is effectively same is as though you recreated the whole thing. I mean, effectively, every no. field is going to be updated. I think, right? That's the whatever is missing or whatever is different. Well, we we have that was different. Um, uh, different and immutable, uh, non-immutable. Sorry. Well, 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 no, because if it's immutable, then the patch fails. The patch just fails. Like if there are immutable fields that are different, then the patch fails, and then all we end up doing is we we then attempt to update labels only. So. In other words, if there are three fields that have changed and one is immutable and two are not, then the update policy gets none of those changed. Yeah, yeah. Because you know Valero doesn't really have any insight as to which of the fields are immutable. It just gets an error back right. saying you tried to modify an immutable field that it failed. Um, so it, so we feel we we don't update the item, uh, and that's where the up the, the recreate policy comes into effect. Is that if the patch fails because of immutable fields or whatever, the next thing Valero is going to do is delete the item in the cluster, and recreate it. Yeah, it's it's clear now. Thank you. Yeah, but but, but we, we won't delete it unless the patch fails. So for the normal case where the patch would have worked anyway, we don't delete and recreate. Right. But but a general point, uh, even for the new 1.12 feature replace, right, is it's impossible to get uh, create plus delete work in all cases. And I think if somebody's yeah. restoring, it's almost guaranteed that they should expect, you know, in some cases they'll end up with an inconsistent system. 
um, it, it, it's simply not possible to get guarantee hundred percent. Yeah, and and, and that's why I that's why yeah. I want us to implement that um, more selective feature so that yeah. users can be very deliberate about they only want to delete and recreate certain resources that they really care about because it's risky. Right, right, that makes sense. I think the workaround was create a different restore uh, for those resources. And... Right. Yeah, but, then you have to, but but yeah. that doesn't work if. Well, no, I guess it would work. You, you would just have yeah. to do it includes excludes. You have to yep. do a restore with like, um, although you, you end up with dependency issues there too, but these are all edge cases that we can deal with. Um, yeah. No, worst case, you might end up doing one restore after another, right? One you do very selective replacement. Right, 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 that's true. Basically, one, one thing you could do is you just, you just do a replace restore. And then if you get any warnings about mm -hmm. center replace, uh, an update, if you get any warnings, you look at those warnings to see what failed, then you do another restore with just those resource types with set to replace. So, so you so you set your include resources to only include the things that failed, right. like yeah. just secrets or just config maps or whatever. Um, restore those things. Uh, destructive, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good information. Yep, thank you, folks. Yeah. Thank you, and. Um, in parallel, uh, Wes started the discussion about the roadmap and utilizing the wiki. Yeah. In particular. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna start just throwing some raw thoughts up there in in a section, just so you can see some of the things that we'd like, and, and who knows what release they go into, right? Um, initially, but uh, we, yeah, I think that was created recently and we just haven't started using it. So it, I think yeah. it would be really helpful if we yeah. did. Yeah, we, we've you, gotten you a lot mean... better recently about, about scoping, you know, what's in the next release, what's in the next, next release. But um, unfortunately we still have very little insight as to, for example, right now, what's at, what, what's beyond 1.12, you know, what else are we considering, yeah. you know, for 1.13, 1.14 yeah. and have, having these kinds of longer term discussions um, in a documents, you know, would be good for planning purposes for anyone that's, you know, using this. You mean different one than this one, right? Correct. Like, well, well, yeah, well, yeah. Like the vision, the vision for the project, not like specific issues that are gonna go to the next release, uh, like a long term. Uh, where I, mean, we see I, Valero, I would say it's a bit of both. I mean, even like for example, specific issues that are not in one twelve, we don't have listed here. Like, like you know, for example, the the, long, the we've been talking for a long time about doing the um, you know allowing multiple backups to happen at the same time, working in parallel. That's a feature that's on. In in theory, in the on the roadmap, but you know it's not in 1.12, so we don't have it tagged with a milestone, and we don't you know we don't know where it's going, what the priority is. Um, having some way of kind of thinking about the you know okay, here's the things that we'd like to have in 1.13 or 1.14. Which of those is a higher priority? You know, we, we don't get around to this, the explicit scoping like we do with the current release, but just some some idea of where we're going next would be helpful. Yeah. But in that case, I I think we should do these kind of sessions to discuss where we're going next. We I I'm not sure if we've done that before, like right. destroying ideas. Uh, we now we discuss pretty much what's currently on the table, like what we see in one year release or something. So this kind of uh, long-term feature stuff, we don't discuss that regularly or at all. So. Yeah, I, I'd love to have that like a long term, super long in the future, like five years of now. <laughs> roadmap. But, but, what, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, there's the kind of there's several several levels there. But 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 I think at least for me, you know, I think the most interesting part of all that um, is, is again, the, you know, the the what kinds of things are we looking at for the next couple of releases? You know, beyond 1.12. Uh, obviously, we don't spend a lot of time on that because our focus is getting the 1.12 stuff together. But kind of knowing what's next um, is going to kind of helpful from a planning point of view, um, even if we don't get around to making commitments to okay, this is really going to be one dot thirteen because that that actual scoping and commitment part does, obviously won't happen until one dot twelve is out. But having some idea of what we think we'd like in one dot thirteen and one dot fourteen, you know, would be would be helpful even if it's not something that we spend a whole lot of time on. Yeah. And but that also do... becomes relevant because if we think about, you know, if we were say right now going through the 1.12 roadmap and, and and doing the, you know, candidate features and we're saying hey, we, we want, you know, you know, we have this list of 10 features and we, we identify five of these as we know we want in 1.12. So there might be five more features we're saying, 
okay, we like these, but we don't have time to get them in 112. Let's put them in, you know, in kind of potential for 1.13 or whatever. So we have, you know, even even the scoping for the current release might end up filling in some of those next release things tentatively, saying we know we want this, but we know we can't do it right now. Let's move it to the next to the next release as kind of backlog roadmap kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Rather than just say, okay, it, 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 it you know it fell out of 1.12, so we're forgetting about it and it's not documented as you know that we would like to do it soon. Mm -hmm. Um just not sure if th that wiki is the most useful tool. I mean if there's a better place to do that, that's you know. I mean, who owns that thing? I mean, who is allowed to write stuff in there? How we verify that among the community? You could and also like do this. it with, 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 you could also do it by, you know, cause like, you know how we do the like 1.12 candidate, you know, tags or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we could create things like 1.13 candidate or midterm candidate or things like that, where we kind of categor can categorize GitHub issues that way. That, that might work too, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I think at a high level, um, Kind of Wes's point in mind is uh, that we, we need some place to do this, some place to discuss this and document yep. this. Um, what that place is, you know, we need to decide um, and kind of work well, towards having uh, that. I'll try to bring that to you. To... Mm -hmm. um, I'll try to get Pradeep tomorrow and uh, get his ideas. I, I think you, Wes, you typed him, so he'll bring, he'll bring back. So, um, yeah. Maybe maybe he, he has some uh, some good ideas how we can organize that thing. The, because the the whole effort is clear, but um, I'm just not sure how we should organize it in the most appropriate way. Okay. Sure. Anyone wants to add something to that topic? Any any ideas? Yes, Tiger, we are here. Where, where have you been? Okay, it's time to close. We are five past the hour. So, okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great one. And talk to you in two weeks with that auditorium and in one week with the China folks. All right. Bye. Have a good one. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.